The next time the story picks up, Stephen Schoen entering Citopolis Gym. I don't really have much to comment here, considering it's a pretty standard Pokemon battle episode. However, we can assume that a good bit of time has passed since Steven's goal last time was to hunker down and train. It shows in the power of his Agron, who manages to weather two of Wan's three Pokemon, despite his type disadvantage. Whatever else happened in Meteor Falls, it must have been pretty major. Oh yeah, Wallace is pretty stunned when, after finally having their battle, Steven ends up kicking his ass. To be honest, I was too. Matang, still not in its final form, managed to triumph against a melodic with mostly steel-type attacks, which water is resistant to. A melodic owned by a future gym leader slash usurper champion. That thing was a melodic when Steven met Wallace in Shoal Cave however long ago, so bear in mind it's had the same amount of time to train as the rest of Steven's team since then. The more I see of Steven's blooming potency, the more I have to wonder what he's doing that every other trainer isn't. The Ash Ketchum from Pokemon Ultimate Adventures turned out to be a superhuman entity, chosen by godlike forces to defend the planet's populace. Merlin Darai from Phoenix Rising is the world's most powerful trainer, but it turns out that happened because his parents made a Faustian bargain with some demonic forces. When you factor out all the trainers who aren't hard workers, or sufficiently bonded with their Pokemon, you're still left with many like Steven, Wallace, and Roxanne. But because he's the protagonist this time around, and a canonical champion, Steven gets treated like he's different. Wolfland's now written several other stories involving Steven, so more is likely still to come. I believe that, even if nobody told him, he'd eventually see that a vital piece of the puzzle is missing, and would sculpt one that fits. By the time you listen to this, he may have done so already. After his victory over Citopolis Jim, Steven returns home to Rasporo to see his dad and have his redemption match against Roxanne. However, instead of another battle chapter, we see a bonding episode in which Steven spends a little R&R with his Pokemon. His dad's off on a business trip, leaving only the housekeeper, which gets Steven thinking that his Pokemon team has become closer to family now. Dad's just never home. And the cat's in the cradle and the shoe is full. Little boy blue and the man on the phone. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. But we'll get together then. Steven knows that he's nearing the end of his Pokemon journey, and that the odds of beating the Elite Four are notoriously slim. Thus, before he resigns himself to becoming a company man for his father, Steven decides to savor his time left with his Pokemon. They revisit old places, find a berry farm, and Matang finally evolves into Metagross. Wait, hang on. I may need to correct this sentence before that. From the way Steven talks about it, one gets the impression that he won't get to do Pokemon Trainer stuff anymore once his Hoenn campaign ends. I don't see why that has to be true, but even if it was, what happens to his Pokemon team? Releasing them is surely out of the question, given his feelings about what Garrett did. Taking business trips out of town is obviously part of the job, at least as company president. Steven could surely make time to travel, as much as, say, two months, and relieve his glory days now and then. You might say, it's not the same, Steven would only have a pale shadow of the trainer's life. That might be true, but he's a rich kid. I think it's fair to say that if he really wanted to take as much as a year off to trek another region, he could easily afford to. Perhaps this is really a metaphor about growing up and becoming a productive member of society. Your body grows, your friends grow, and you go around doing popular things, hoping to find your reason for it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but at the end of the journey is the real world and becoming an adult in it. It's a bit scary, 
and you don't want your current adventure to end, because the life ahead looks tedious and has bills and taxes. But it's inevitable, so you feel the need to cherish the moment. Unless, of course, your childhood sucked. Then the metaphor falls apart. Anyway, the latter part of the chapter establishes how much Stephen has grown, improved, and team-bonded. This is where the mention of multiple years is dropped, though my intuition still insists it was a matter of months until something convinces me otherwise. Papa Stone then gives him a call to drop by, and Stephen figures his team has rested enough. It's time to score their final badge. As we know, Stephen fights Roxanne and wins. The chapter establishes that she's upped her game since her days as a schoolgirl, but there was never really a question of Stephen's victory. From Roxanne's perspective towards the end, we get to see that Stephen's developed an intense battle stare, like he's picked it up from his days in the Vietnam War. I know it's supposed to be from all the prior gym matches and dangerous cave excursions, but it seems to me that the Skarmory incident should still leave the biggest mental scar. After this, Stephen flies to Evergrande's, Evergrande's Victory Road, where he is overjoyed to see that the last obstacle is another cave. It was like they threatened him with a day at Six Flags. In retrospect, I find his reaction a lot funnier, and I like how it built upon his previously established character profile. With a more cheerful demeanor than probably any other candidate ever, Stephen heads on into the Underdark. This is one of my favorite episodes, as it brings up things about the trainer journey that fans aren't often required to think about. Primarily, there's this. Life goes on after the trainer journey ends, which is what I was saying just a couple minutes back. But there exist those who don't have a life worth going back to, and Wolflin presents them as fallen hopefuls, trapped in a limbo of their own choosing. They become scavengers and thieves in the dark, an unintended obstacle of Victory Road for those trainers still trying to become champion. And why? Because they were too afraid to face what might have been. When you first start collecting Pokémon and gym badges, your mind's more focused on the present task of gathering a team and seeing what the world has to offer. But the more you persist, the more you commit, the more is eventually at stake. Pokémon gyms can be re-challenged as many times as it takes to clear them. But like with the anime, you only get one shot at the elites. If you fail, or rather, when you fail, in all likelihood, that stays on your permanent record. So, what do you do? Advance into the jaws of defeat, like all the others? Or suspend your progress at the highest possible place before the point of no return? At least with the latter, you can extend your current status indefinitely, and maintain whatever illusion you've created of yourself. I've gone and taken it a little further than the antagonist of this chapter, when she takes interest in Steven after her gang mugs him. Sheila's logic was hinted on the assumption that being champion is every trainer's dream, not the idea that you're already living the dream every day of the journey. The fact is, you don't actually lose anything when you fall to the Elite Four. You simply fail to gain a temporary throne. Your Pokémon, your badges, and your accumulated wisdom are already yours. If I'd hypothetically been one of the fallen trainers in Sheila's band, my joining wasn't to avoid a return to my former life, as stated in the chapter. It wouldn't have been the fear of broken dreams either. I'd simply have joined to forever maintain my status as a champion candidate, someone who might have won the throne, rather than someone who definitively didn't. I might be viewed as a coward, but I'd retain my perpetual benefit of having a chance. The rest of the chapter is mostly just a plotline you've likely seen before. Selfish bad guy gets unmasked for who they really are in front of their loyal followers. See the first two episodes of Full Metal Alchemist, 
or that Star Trek episode where Gold Dukat plays a cult leader, to name a couple. However, it was neat to see Sidney make a guest appearance, even if we don't witness his rise to Elite Four member.